So the, the first uh, category of law could be categorized as moral laws. So the Ten Commandments are a pretty good example of that. Don't kill people. Okay. So re remember that rule about not hitting my brother with a stick? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good example of a moral law. It's, it's a rule placed about a particular situation, but it extends far beyond that. Don't hit people with sticks is a pretty good law for all people, all time, all places. So how, how does Jesus fulfill the moral law? He says he fulfills the law. How does he fulfill the moral law? Well, Jesus really carries forward the moral law. So he takes it from where it is presented in the Old Testament, the law, the teachings, the prophets, and he brings it forward. And that's what a lot of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is going to be about. It's going to be Jesus explaining, you heard it this way, but I'm going to share with you the fullness. So stay tuned for that portion. The second category of law would be considered a ceremonial law. So the, the laws that have to do with doing the right things at the right time in the right way. And the, the primary goal of the, the ceremonial laws that the Jews had was to be able to approach God well. And so an, an example of that would be in Leviticus, it talks about how to handle sacrifices properly. What do you do with this thing that you are presenting to God? Where do you put it? How do you burn it? What do you do with the ashes when you're done? It's all a, a distinctive in how to approach God well. You remember that, that electric fence rule? Is electric fences are a very useful tool for farms and ranches that you can set up and it helps provide a boundary for the animals, but you set it up in a particular way, in a particular place, at a particular time, and perhaps most importantly, you plug it in at the right time. Now, <clears throat> yes, right time is a big deal. So how, how does Jesus fulfill the ceremonial law, this distinctiveness of approaching God well. So for the, the Jewish people, their main place of worship was the temple. And in the temple, there was a, a huge curtain that separated the inner holy of holies, the dwelling place of God, from the place where all the rest of you dirty buggers live. And in order to enter into this holy of holy place, you had to pass through the curtain. Hebrews 10 tells us that Jesus' body has become the veil, that curtain that allows us to approach God with confidence. Because Jesus paid the right price at the right time, in the right way, the law was completed. The veil is no longer there. The person of Jesus provides us access to the Father. The ceremonial law has been completed. Third grouping, there's clean and unclean laws, and these are probably the most self-explanatory, is avoid dirty things and clean yourself up if you get dirty. Uh, you remember the, the calf chains rule? Uh, if you use anything to pull a calf out of its mother, Mom will probably not appreciate that in her kitchen sink. Be clean. So we, we have a good idea today of how germs work, these little microscopic organisms that are on everything and around all over the place and, and how they play a role in our health and well-being, what is dirty, what is clean. But in, in the grand scheme of things, we learned about germs about five minutes ago. And so God provides this way for the, the people of Israel without them knowing the intricacies of how and why things work, that there are certain things that are clean and beneficial for the external and internal body and things that are unclean for the external and internal body. So how does Jesus fulfill the cleanliness laws? Matthew 15 kind of flips the, the paradigm from the, the Jewish laws, primarily being external, is eat this food, don't eat that food, don't combine these things, to focusing primarily on internal cleanliness. Jesus says, what comes out of a man's mouth is what makes him unclean, not what goes in. And so Jesus 
begins to purify our hearts and our mouths, completing the clean and unclean laws. Grouping four, civil laws. So think of all of the, the different festivals that the, the Jewish people would have had, the Israelites, is there are these events, these times of year that separate, and they are, they are times to celebrate what God has done and to, to look forward to the arrival of the Messiah. They're times to, to slow down and remember that we are part of God's creation. And so we, ha we have similar things, uh, calendar events that we mark the year by, 4th of July, Easter, Christmas, all of these settings throughout the year that remind us to slow down and observe what's going on in the world around us. So for the, the civil laws, do you, do you remember that, that rule about we drive red tractors? So that was something that granddad did. Granddad started the farm in 1956 and started with red tractors, and so now we still have red tractors, and it's, it's a matter of, of distinctiveness. It sets us apart from the farms around, but it also helps call back to a heritage. It reminds us of what has gone before, of what makes us us, and how we navigate the world. So how does Jesus fulfill the civil laws? Again, it's by addressing the distinctiveness of the people. A lot of the Jewish distinctiveness is an external thing. The clothes that we wear, the scriptures that we tie to our foreheads and our arms, is they are all distinctives and how they interact with the world. When we get to, to Hebrews 8.10, like we read in the scripture reading this morning, God says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This external scripture, this external thing that makes us distinctive, Jesus internalizes. We are now distinct because of the way God transforms our hearts. So that's four out of the five. I'm gonna do a quick recap because number five is a big one. First off, moral laws are brought forward and into a new depth. Jesus brings forward the moral law. Ceremonial laws are completed through the person of Jesus providing access to the Father. Clean and unclean laws are completed by internalizing cleanliness of heart and mind. And civil laws are completed by becoming internally distinctive rather than externally distinctive. Right, for the big one, sacrificial laws. So what is the, the purpose of a sacrificial law? As we, we are all aware just of existing in the world that actions have consequences. Uh, when something misses the mark, and accidentally or intentionally, there are consequences to be paid. And ideally, those consequences will match the action. So remember that, that rule about staying out late? You can stay out as, as late as you want, but tomorrow morning you're gonna be out in the field doing things at the same time, is there's a cost to be paid of lost sleep. So that's, that's a pretty small cost in the grand scheme of things, but there's a cost nonetheless. For the Jews, there were a number of, of different sacrificial offerings that were practiced and presented to the Lord. And each one of those had associated costs. Uh, there were actually five different distinctives in there, but different story for a different time. We're just zoning in today on the fact that actions have consequences and prices must be paid. So there's really two parts of the sacrificial law that we need to know about. The, the offering of the sacrificial law was done by priests. The everyday Joe on the street did not have the capacity, the knowledge, in order to present the sacrifice as well, so they were done through a selected group of priests, the Levites. And so there's, there's the person issuing the sacrifice, but there's also the sacrifice itself that is being made. So with those two distinctives, Jesus does something that's, that's kind of unusual, but is absolutely incredible by becoming both the high priest and the sacrifice. 